patience and coming back in and getting settled. We're going to begin session 13. We're going to begin session 13. And this is going to be dealing with um, media and the black student athlete. Uh, and the presentation, the next presentation is titled Through Our Eyes, a critical analysis on the effects of archetypes placed on black student athletes. And the presenter will be uh, Gerard, is it Gerard? Jared. Jared. Oh, oh, you got a microphone over there. That's cool. Uh, Jared Barnes from Clemson University. So everybody give Jared a round of applause, please, as he comes forward. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I know we still got people filing in, but wanted to say uh, Dr. Lori Pindar, who really helped us uh, create this pre uh, presentation, is unable to make it today. And she passed the mic to me. So speaking on behalf of the group today, and I'm very, very excited to be here. And today, um, as our intro introduction said, we're talking about archetypes and, and the, these uh, stereotypes and, and the effects of that that are placed on black student athletes. And we entitled the presentation Through Our Eyes uh, because uh, those of us in the group have experiences as student athletes, as administrators, and support staff. Um, so if you want to go ahead and scroll down. So today what we're going to talk about really uh, understanding the root of these archetypes, or, and I'll get into that later exactly what that is, but understanding the root of the effects uh, of what's happening, what's going on in the world, and how, these, how the media is affecting uh, our student athletes. Uh, then we're going to talk about, too, we're going to go through some case studies, looking at examples uh, of just recent events going on in, in, in our world. And then third, and I think most importantly, uh, solutions. Really today is it, focused on solutions and how we can help uh, our student athletes move forward uh, through these situations. So real quick, uh, all the student athletes, raise your hand in the room. Okay, just want to get a feel. Can all my Division I administrators, faculty, support staff, if you work at Division I school, can you raise your hand? Okay, how about Division II? Okay, Division Three. any Division Three? Okay, and most important people in the room, high schools. Do we have any high school administrators or coaches, staff? Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you. Just helps give me an understanding. And, and so I mentioned uh, where this came from. It actually came from uh, Dr. Lori Pindar. She is a uh, faculty member with Clemson University in the Irwin Center for Brand Communication, where she uh, uses technology to study uh, Twitter analytics, social media analytics, um, how that affects individuals and companies and their brands. Uh, and, and so we use that uh, information when looking at black student athletes. Uh, so go ahead and scroll, please. And so. You go up for me real quick, back up. Right there, good, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's Adobe Spark, I like it a lot better than uh, PowerPoint. But looking at the root, we're talking about the root, uh, and I think in today's culture, we have such a heavy pursuit of social capital. I think Dr. Gill touched on it uh, before, but there's such a heavy pursuit to be verified, to be relevant, to be liked. And uh, he mentioned in Missouri how it took off because of social media, and now uh, you know we see in locker rooms, we see in, in, in these collegiate environments how heavy it, uh, the social media presence is and how that's so important to young people. And if you go ahead and scroll down, uh, it was important to me. So I'm a former uh, Ohio State football player. This is a picture before our uh, Fiesta Bowl game. I don't want to talk about how the game went. but. <laughs> Before the game, you know, I had the Apple Watch on, checking the social media. Man, how many likes am I getting? You know, am I, am I, am I trending? You know, it, how, that makes me feel good. And so if you were to do, I haven't done, but if you were to do an ethnographic study, which is just an observation of behavior, consistent behavior in a natural environment, if you were to do one in a collegiate athletic locker room, you would see a whole lot of this and not, not a lot of talking. And, and, and so... The, the significance of amount of cell phone and social media use, that shapes conversations, that shapes pedagogies and ways of thoughts, that shapes behavior, that shapes what you think is possible in your life. And so now there's this consistent desire, again, to be relevant, to be verified, and to gain that social capital. So go ahead and scroll, please. And so mention the archetype. Again, all an archetype is is a typical example of a person or a uh, thing. That's what Mary Webster finds it. And, and I mentioned the patterns uh, earlier. And I think this is, is kind of a key to uh, the presentation in patterns in, in, in thought, patterns in what you see consistently in front of you uh, will shape the way you think. And go ahead and scroll. And so we're looking at case studies now, case studies of some uh, events going on. I don't know how many of you watch the national championship game. Uh, but Makai Brown, a young man, now a former Alabama linebacker, uh, former, 
<laughs> made, a, made one mistake, or a series, I'll say a series of mistakes. And, and the media painted him, you know, as, as the guy, the kid who, you know, lost his head, who went crazy on the sideline. But all I saw was a young man with incredible potential who was never really trained how to handle his emotions. That's all it was. And, and, and now I feel for him because he's transferring to Tennessee State. I don't know how successful he's going to be at Tennessee State with everything that follows him. Um, and I did ran a um, search on Twitter. He had over 3.5 million impressions uh, yesterday. That was just, that was so two weeks after or a week and a half after the game. Over 3.5 million impressions. Uh, so what that does him? What what would that do to him? You know, as a human being, when you're being talked about like that, talked about in that manner, um, you know, I I can't imagine that. That's that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of anxiety. The research will tell you. You know, the more uh, important social media is to you, the more it affects you. And, and so um, that is a case right there of, I just labeled it the cost of one decision. So you might not be working with Mikhail Brown, or, excuse me, Mikhail Brown, but you might be working with a student athlete who has made a bad decision and been covered by the media. And, and so when we get into recommendations, we'll talk about that. But that's one case. So go down, please. The second case, Simone Biles, US uh, Olympian uh, gymnast, the GOAT, one of the greatest of all time at age 20, unbelievable athlete but recently came out and said, you know, she had experienced some sexual abuse from uh, a, a, a trainer who was going on trial um, the very next day. And so she came out and said that at a critical time. And she was being an advocate. She was part of the Me Too campaign. She put on her Twitter uh, that, you know, it's impossibly difficult to relive these experiences. We need to know why this was able to take place for so long. We need to make sure something like this never happens again. Such a bold statement, a powerful statement coming from someone with so much relevance in her context. You know, well, well decorated Olympian and world champion, but now she's experiencing the cost of advocacy. And, and ask any advocate in the room or any advocate in general, and there's a cost associated with that. Same as uh, our, our, the young man before, there's, there's pressure, the weight, and she now has CNN, Fox News at her front door waiting for her to make a statement. And, and so how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? That's what um, we really wanted to get into, again, on the solutions. So go ahead and scroll down for me. Solutions. Uh, speaking to administrators and support staff, uh, first, I, I, I've been able to spend uh, the, probably about the past month uh, traveling around the country, interviewing different uh, professionals in student athlete development, in academia, in uh, the same space we all are in and asking what they are doing for their students. And surprisingly, a majority of them are not creating what uh, you know, is defined as human-centered programming or human-centered, uh, using human-centered design and really trying to use a program that maybe somebody else used or use a program that had been recommended to them. Uh, and what I'm articulating to you, excuse me, is that you take a critical look at exactly what your students need, not necessarily what you know, the world is telling you to do or someone else may do, tell you to do, but exactly what your students need through focus groups, through assessments, uh, that's for you to decide. This is more a framework. Take a shift towards more experiential learning and focus on uh, helping students make decisions. Focus on their thought process, analyzing that, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to say that we need to change the media and change what, you know, they're saying, because they are, are trying to get paid just like we're trying to get paid. And they, they're excited when somebody makes a mistake because that's a story. And, and so how do you combat that? You don't put yourself in, in that light. And you help students uh, train the way they think, to train the way they react to certain situations. Um, help make the connection, help explain the why to a platform and, and how student athletes have access to that and what that means. Um, I'll get into this a little bit further of a personal example, but a platform can have a far greater impact uh, than you may realize and goes on with you uh, for the rest of your life potentially. And then the last thing um, is very, very important of consistent incremental change. I promise you if you have consistent conversations with student athletes, it could be daily, it could be weekly, it could be monthly, uh, you know, small conversations about social identity, about how they're perceived in the media, about what they want to, uh, you know, what kind of legacy they want to leave will be much more effective than one program or, or a, a one uh, series of programs. When you, what you consistently put in front of people uh, will be retained and remembered much more than one program. And I know it sounds very simple, but you would be shocked to how many people don't do that. Uh, you think about a coach. The coach is consistently reinforcing uh, 
uh, team culture, consistently reinforcing what the, the game plan is that week, consistently reinforcing what the rules and expectations are, yet we as professionals don't do that with what we're trying to get across. So why would we not take that exact same approach? That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to say your program is ineffective. No, that's not it. What I'm saying is it could be more effective if carried through continuous conversations daily. And so now, the student athletes who I really want to talk to, because I'm a former student athlete myself, played at two different uh, top 25 FBS football programs, and have seen uh, a lot, also spending years as a defensive backs coach, and un kind of understand uh, what exactly students need. And so this is a mix of what the research tells us uh, from my personal life, and then also through observation. And so student athletes, uh, would probably the most important thing, not, excuse me, not probably, what the most important thing you can do for your college experience is understand who you are as an individual outside of your sport. Understand who you are. So if I were to ask you, you know, what do you stand for? And not say anything about your sport, not say anything about your team, but able to answer that question, I'm willing to bet you're going to go on and be successful in life. Understanding your behavioral triggers, what, what, what makes you angry and how you respond to that. How you, how, how you respond in certain situations. When your coach yells at you, how, do you, how does that make you feel? How do you deal with that? What are your coping mechanisms? I know this is a little bit more of the mental health piece, but it's also very, very important because this, the social media, that triggers a mental health response. Excuse me, it triggers a mental response. Uh, know exactly what you want out of your college experiences, being proactive versus reactive. I knew from when I was 18 years old, I wanted to graduate in under three years. So I did not wait for my academic advisor to schedule classes for me. I went to my academic advisor, told them, this is, these are the classes I'm taking. Here is my graduation plan. Can we do this or can we not? What adjustments do I need to make? They said, OK, you know, you need to take this class, this class, it'll comply with practice. Good. I did not wait for someone to create my life for me. I wanted to create my own life. That's what gives you options. As long as you are waiting for your coach or support staff to guide you through this, and I'm not saying they won't guide you through it. They will. That's their, their job, and they really do generally care. But what I am saying is that you have just as much power as they do. Don't sell yourself short. And the third thing, uh, you kill the noise. Kill the noise. I actually, uh, while I was training um, for the NFL, training for the uh, pro day at Ohio State, took a fast from social, me social media. Didn't get on social media for about six months. And it was probably the most uh, healthy I'd ever felt because I no longer put the uh, opinions of others above the opinion of myself. And, and what that did for me, it showed me um, what, what that life is like when you don't always succumb to what, what the culture or what the world will tell you. And go ahead and scroll down for me. And so what, what uh, we had the chance to do at Clemson was run a workshop that focused entirely on self-awareness. And we challenged uh, student athletes to critically think about who they are as people, critically think about their social identities, critically think about exactly what, everything I just said, what they want to get out of their college experience. And you would be shocked how many crickets in the room there were. And it took probably, uh, my colleague Julian is here, probably, what, 10, 15 minutes before people started to, to answer? Yep. And, and so it's so interesting that an athlete can be so confident on the field, so confident over Instagram, so confident over Twitter. But then when you ask them, you know, hey, what do you want out of life? Or, or what kind of legacy do you want to leave? It's so challenging uh, your student athletes to do that. Starting at the high school level, I think, is one of the most influential uh, moments in, in a uh, young person's life before they get to a platform like this. So when they are there, they understand how to utilize that platform. And, and so one of my greatest, or excuse me, one of my favorite quotes uh, written by Francis Chan, who's actually a pastor, uh, our greatest fear should not be failure. But, but, at, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. And, and so taking an intentional approach to the holistic development of the student, and I'm advocating for personal development, is what I'm saying. And, and so ending with this, a call to action. What would it look like if every single day you went into your office, and instead of trying to plan your leadership academy, trying to plan uh, you know, some great event and networking and connecting with employers, which is great, which is important, which you know, I've done, what would it look like if you went into the office and said, you know what, I'm going to approach one student athlete today and ask them, ask them a question on their social identity, ask them you know, what they want out of life, and challenge them. The only reason I'm here today is because, actually, some of them in the room, Dr. Samuel Hodge, Dr. Robert Bennett, because they challenged me. They didn't let me settle uh, for, for what everyone else was telling me. They pushed me. It was uncomfortable. I didn't like them at some points, but they got me here.
they were giving me this opportunity to, hand, to, to handle this kind of platform. And it's because of them that I'm here. And so what I'm saying is you have the opportunity and the power and the influence to do that for your student athletes. So that's our presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's uh, actually a, a, a funny answer in that, yes, and you would be surprised how many of the, you know, quote unquote, at risk uh, student athletes will come up to me and ask me how I, how I did it or, you know, what, was, what is your path or how could I do that? Uh, and that, when I talk about a platform, you know, what, what better platform than my own teammate? Um, and, and so it, it was incredibly hard. I, would, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, you know, I had a lot of uh, sleepless nights, but the effect and, and the result was, um, you know, incredible. And, and so it, it was a ripple effect to where even, um, you know, I had a great privilege while I was at Ohio State. Uh, Coach Meyer asked me to speak to the team on uh, the impact of education. And that was probably, if I could, you know, write down most impactful or memorable moments in my life, that would probably be in the top two or three. Um, not because... Um, just speaking, but it was who I was speaking to. So, yes, thank you. Oh, can I say one more thing? Um, I just, quick a thought to the young lady in the back who asked the question. One thing to promote engagement, uh, well, two things. One, micro learning. If you, if you get uh, short uh, videos, I could think through an app. Uh, short engaging videos, two to three minutes, that promotes the most engagement. The second thing is, um, it, it's more elementary, but gamification. So any way you can incorporate a achievement or outcome or you get a trophy or, or something uh, unlocked in the app. You think about video games, Xbox, they have all these achievements. You could put the very similar thing in an app like that and that creates um, you know, a sense of progress and a sense of, oh, I got this and he doesn't. So then it becomes another means of competition, uh, which, caters to the market uh, who you're trying to reach. So those are just two things I thought of, but yeah. Let's get